Coming up, Michael Naranjo has made a name for himself in the world of sculptures despite not being able to see. A new book, Mashkiki Road, teaches Ojibwe values. And it's traditional among the Pueblo people for the men to make clothes for the family. We'll talk to one weaver. I am Aliyah Chavez. Join us for those interviews from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. is the ICT Newscast with Aaliyah Chavez. Amirawa Hopa, thank you for joining us. We start in New Mexico, where Michael Naranjo says sculpting is an obsession for him. He is described as the artist who sees with his hands. Let's take a look at his story. Sculpting is an obsession to me. I have to do it. It lives inside me and it has to come out. That magical moment when I get an idea, it's frightening because I'm afraid to start. But once I start, it's like magic. And then it happens. It's like a baby that has to be born. My sculptures are my children. People are drawn to Michael because his work is more than sculpture. It's a story about a person who succeeded in doing what he was told he couldn't do. I was 22 and drafted into the Vietnam War. I had made it into the jungle and saw a Viet Cong. Suddenly he turned towards me and our eyes met. For a split second we looked at each other and I shot. I felt this ball roll into my hand. It exploded, and I never saw the light of day again. About two weeks after the grenade blast, there was a fly that landed on my face, and I thought, that fly can see, why can't I? And I shed a tear, but that was it. I was laid in a hospital bed and a volunteer asked if there was anything I wanted. After three days of laying there bored, I asked for some water-based clay. I used to play with my mother's clay. And I thought, if I can still make something, I can still be a sculptor. So I thought, what do I make? What do children make when they're starting? They roll out a little ball and they pinch off the end. moment, I found myself again, and I knew what I was going to do with my life. I was going to be a sculptor. Still. When you can see, a blink of an eye tells it all. When you can't see, it's my thumb, my pointer finger, and my middle finger that are my eyes when I work. Whenever I'm sculpting or looking at anything, there are tens and thousands of touches being relayed to my mind's eye as to what my fingertips are seeing. So it's like a picture puzzle being put together. It's not just about the sculpture. It's about what it stands for. It's not just the motion in the pieces, it's the emotion that comes through the pieces. When you love something and you take care of it and you work at it, you nourish it and it grows. It's like anything else in life that 
to take part in. When I met Michael, I was 25 years old, and within a year we were married. I've been so fortunate to not only witness, but to be part of this journey. I wouldn't trade anything in the world to see again. My life as I have it is the life that I've always wanted, so why would I change anything? Being blind is, is of no consequence. Living my life as a sculptor is like nothing else in the world. It's magic, it's ecstasy, it's a beautiful, wonderful life that I have. Michael is truly an incredible artist. His sculptures show movement and expression. That was evident in his first piece of art. One of the first art commissions I received was making a hoop dancer in front of state capital in New Mexico. And the dancer is going through this hoop and he's seven feet tall as he's going through the hoop. And if he stood up, he would be about, oh, somewhere between 11 and 12 feet tall. So it was quite, uh, a project for me to work on, being able to only use one hand and no eyes. That sounds like quite the project. You also lost, as you just mentioned, the use of your right hand. Maybe talk about how you've been able to sculpt such large pieces uh, using, you know, such limited tools. I, I guess visual imagery comes into the picture a great deal. Um, memories also, because I don't have anything really to look at or go by, photographs or anything, so it's all within my head. So the image in my mind relays um, messages to my fingertips, and what my fingertips are touching sends messages back. Um, so it's, uh, it's quite a project to keep everything in proportion. It's kind of like a picture puzzle, I always say, uh, putting everything together and making it work. You work with uh, children who are blind and you also teach sculpting. Do you also work with uh, veterans groups? I have on, re on occasions uh, worked with, have created workshops with veterans, yes. That's wonderful news. Um, Michael, you once had the amazing opportunity to feel Michelangelo's sculpture of David, and our producers were preparing me for this interview, and I thought, oh my gosh, what an experience. Tell us what that was like. Oh, it was a dream come true. I had seen uh, photos of that when I could see. I was able to see it for the first 22 years of my life. And uh, on the day that uh, I was able to look at the day that with my fingers, uh, there's a scaffolding and the museum was closed and they built the scaffolding for me around the David. And there are three levels of it. So I was able to look at Michelangelo's David for about three hours. And I started from the head and went down to the feet. And of course, it, uh, the hair on the back of my neck stood up when I first started touching him and looking at him. An incredible moment and the mem a memory I'll never forget. And had they told you or provided context as to how many people have been able to touch the sculpture before? I, they, they've never mentioned that, but I would imagine very few. I'm sure uh, Michelangelo and his helpers uh, worked on it. And every mm -hmm. four years or so, they were dusted. Uh, so they dusted Michelangelo, the David, before uh, I looked at it. Uh, so not very many people because it's such a, it's a, such a fragile, monumental piece. I can imagine. You know, typically when you visit a museum, there um, are signs that tell you, uh, caution, don't touch um, the art. But you have actually a different take on that concept. Um, tell us about the exhibits where you encourage visitors to touch the art. All my exhibits that I have are accessible because they are created without sight and solely by touch. And so my wife writes amazing letters and that's why we've been able to touch so many other pieces uh, around the country and in other countries as well, uh, sending letters ahead of time to museums. That's wonderful that it's able to become accessible to you in that way. Um, what are you working on right now? At the moment, 
I am working on uh, Adam and Eve. And um, my wife uh, teases me and tells me, I guess you're going back to the beginning. So uh, it's, uh, it's I, I create pieces from all aspects of uh, life, uh, religions and time periods and cultures. So my, my pieces vary a great deal from the animals to the human form. Your work, of course, can be seen in the Heard Museum in Phoenix, the White House, and even the Vatican. Uh, do you have a favorite piece to date? Oh, my goodness. I don't know. There are bits and pieces of so many pieces that are just incredible. Uh, so just the thrill of being able to touch a piece and to enjoy it and to get now. pleasure out of it uh, is, is what is really there. Michael, we only have a short time left here, but um, if someone's listening to this interview and um, they also have um, a different kind of ability and they want to uh, delve into the world of art, what is your message to them? I, no one can do it for you. And if you don't try, you don't succeed. And just go out there and do it and believe in yourself and, uh, no art is uh, right um, according to anyone else's eyes because you made it and the way you make it is the way it should be and it should that's just the way it is. And uh, art is beautiful and it's lasted over the centuries. When we come back, we'll talk to two authors of books about Native history and culture. Returning Home is a book about the Intermountain Indian School in Utah. It was the largest federal boarding school that operated between 1950 and 1984. Farina King is an associate professor of Native American Studies at the University of Oklahoma and is one of the three authors of the book. It's really feeling that intergenerational trauma that my, my own father almost died um, by trying to run away in a snowstorm from uh, a boarding school in New Mexico, and hearing all these stories from um, my aunties, uncles, cousins, even, uh, it is hard. But what was inspiring about this was um, actually a good friend of ours named Jesse, um, Jesse Holiday from Sebi in the Sky, which is Monument Valley. It's famous for the iconic images in movies, and I identified as the West, but it's the Ne homeland, and it was where Jesse was from. So I started to see that Jesse um, had artwork. He'd do watercolors of home. And I talked to him, and he told me he also went to boarding school. And I thought, whoa, where's this disconnect of, you know, he, he told me that he actually learned how to do um, paint and watercolor in boarding school. So that was very impressive to me because I thought, you know, about all these dark aspects and sensitive aspects of boarding schools. But he then told me art pulled me out. That's how he got through a lot of those hard times was um, envisioning home and expressing that through his art. And we found that with poetry too. So putting that together in a book was also what um, Intermountain alumni asked us to do. And we felt like we had to do that for them, for their their children too, and posterity that they know they were they're artists, they are poets, even though they went through so much hardship. Let's actually talk more about that. Is there a specific poem that stands out to you? Um, you know, when you were doing this research, and ultimately what ends up in the book? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's some poems that range on, and there's actually stories. Um, a poet that resonated with all of us that were working on this book because it, it not only involved um, the co-authors, Michael and James, we also um, worked with a Navajo Dene Bazad translator, Rena Dunn, um, and others, Terrence Ride, students, different people. And one person and the story um, being really incredible was Henry Tinhorn. He actually um, died very young after uh, graduating from Intermountain. He um, went to Vietnam and passed away there. I didn't realize this, but I knew and had interviewed, uh, done an oral history with his sister before I even knew that connection. And Michael happened to be a neighbor to her. 
And so we'd read his work, like Mountains Lament, where he talked, talks about the mountains crying because their children are missing. And to Diné, the sacred mountains are the sign, you know, they are our archives, they are our ways of thinking, um, and they are the refuge, the signs of our homeland. And so in his poem, he's really critically thinking and expressing, you know, personifying the, the mountains, Zich, um, and showing how they're feeling about their children being taken away from them. And that's a very powerful poem and also his story and how we connected with his family through this project and shared his own, his work with them and his, his relatives and kin. We only have a short time here left, but I want to ask you on a personal level how you learn about all of these really heavy topics. And as you mentioned, they affect your, your own family. I think um, I want people to know what my... It, it is hard. Um, you know, the, the tears to me are a lot of healing. But it also is inspiring because we are descendants of survivors and we don't have to constantly be gripping on to life. It's that connection of family, home, lands and water that bring us that hope and keeps us going. And the hope is healing. And so I, I know my father is very fortunate. It was a miracle that he survived. And when he was a child going through that snowstorm and it happened that there was a rancher out there who was able to take him out, uh, out of that and save his life. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. But I also want to bring light to the, these dark, often hidden stories so that all of us realize every child matters and every child can be you know, um, a mother, a father, an auntie, an uncle, a leader in the community. And it's all tied into these things. So, Mushkiki Road is a picture book that teaches traditional Red Lake Ojibwe values as learned by three cousins. Elizabeth Barrett wrote the story that was inspired by her uncle, Thomas Barrett. So uh, this actually was born um, during the early days of the pandemic. Um, out when the pandemic hit, people were supposed to isolate at home. So for us at the Boys and Girls Club, we didn't have kids coming to our building. So we had to get creative with our programming. And um, we were doing virtual programming. We were sending activity packets home to the kids. And one of the activities was create your own book. So we would like, you know, have a title page and just, um, you know, empty pages for them to draw, to write a story, color, whatever it was. And um, the common themes we were getting back was uh, things around our Ojibwe culture. So, you know, the team got together and said um, to further this children's book uh, project, let's do it about the seven grandfather teachings. And the seven grandfather teachings are part of Anishinaabe culture and other um, indigenous cultures as well. And their respect, truth, wisdom, honesty, humility, courage, and love. So um, we eventually uh, partnered up with um, Elizabeth. I know she's my niece, so I know of her writing capabilities. She was fresh off uh, graduating from Dartmouth University in English literature. And John Thunder, um, he's uh, painted murals for our Boys and Girls Clubs. Uh, we have two Boys and Girls Clubs, one in the community of Red Lake and another in the community of Panema. And he's painted, um, you know, different murals in those gyms to kind of uh, uh, bring more, you know, color and highlight our uh, buildings in that way. So the, they got together, created the book, and it was Elizabeth who um, sent it over to the Minnesota Historical Society, and they eventually published it, and now it's out there for the world. And since then, we've actually seen some pictures of children reading this book. When you watch them read, what do you think that they're taking away from it? Um, well, I guess some things I've heard from the kids is they like... Uh, there's little uh, egg, um, the like hints of Red Lake in there, like the Red Lake Nation flag is in there. The the Red Lake Water Tower that you see in our town here is in it. You know, um, Jonathan Thunder in his unique artistic way dropped those little Easter eggs in there. And then um, it's it's cool to see that they're gaining some knowledge about Ojibwe culture in that way. And it's even more cool to see non-Indigenous or non-Ojibwe, you know, kids and people pick up this book and 
they can learn a piece of our culture in this way. So it's a, uh, it's it's really empowering to see young people read this book and learn about their culture. I could imagine for the young people who are reading the book, as you said, who see their tribal flag reflected in the book, who see the water tower, I imagine that that means so much to them, um, you know, to see them represented on pages of a children's book. It is, you know, um, it's something we try to do at our Boys and Girls Club is, you know, expose them to Anishinaabe values and culture and to, you know, let them know that you could be proud of being from Red Lake and be proud of being Ojibwe. So when they see things in like this professionally made book, it's like, hey, I, I know that flag. I, 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 I live by that water tower. To see those things, it's, um, you know, hopefully it's one more thing that makes them feel proud about being Red Lake. Among the Pueblo people, it is not uncommon to see men making traditional clothing for their families and communities. That's what Chris Velarde does. He is the cultural arts specialist at the Poe Cultural Center near Santa Fe, New Mexico, and he teaches weaving classes. Here in uh, northern New Mexico, weaving has uh, disappeared. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring back just the basics of belt weaving. And that consists of the rain sash belts, the white sash belts, as well as the colored belts that we uh, use for ceremonial purposes. You know, over the times, times have changed a lot. You know, we used to use our traditional belts, which is black, red, and green. But nowadays, women have um, cloth dresses and they, the colored belts are more in demand. You know, a lot of women want their belts to match their dresses. So that's another change in, in our the, the way we live now, you know. There weren't very, very many weavers here in northern New Mexico, so I decided that it was time to start teaching. And I've been teaching here at the Polk Culture Center probably for about uh, five years now. I teach a weaving class, and I usually start in the springtime with a basic um, class, and then I go into uh, rain sash belts the next semester, and the next one is uh, colored belts with designing, you know. And we do a lot of educating, a lot of educating on belts because nowadays there's a lot of people who are just not spinning their their yarn or their you know material you know and that's what makes it a lot tighter it makes it last longer so I try to educate people on that as well and and along with weaving there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, rituals that go with it you know I have um, I had a student that was very upset with the uh, weaving because he just couldn't pass this design that he was working on and uh, I told him, I said, you know, put your loom away for a while, you know, put it away, walk away, leave it for a few days. And after that, come back to it, you know, I said, talk to your loom. You know, we as Native people, we always believe that everything has a spirit. you know. So you want to make sure that that you you're peace with your your loom again, you know. And uh, after a while, I, I asked him, I said, how are you doing? He goes, guess what, Matt, man, you know, calling me uncle, he says, I finally did it. I finally did it. You know, I said, sometimes you just have to walk away, you know? So there's things like that, that take into aspect of, uh, of weaving. It's just not that you're weaving out there and you're making something to sell, you know, a lot of work goes into it. You know, the pain, the tears, you know, the happiness, the prayers that go into it is always important. You know, uh, we always want to make sure that the buyer or the person that we're gifting the belt to, you know, receives all these blessings that go into it and they realize the uh, the work, the amount of work that's done to it, you know. But um, I, I, I enjoy it. I've been weaving probably for about 12 years now, you know. Uh, there's changes, of course. When I was first taught, it was strictly men. It was strictly men. And uh, when I was asked to teach, I had um, a mixture of students. So the first thing I did was I called my my teacher. I says, you know, teacher, I said, I have classes of uh, men and women. I said, where do we go from here, you know? And his answer was, he says, um, you know, times are changing. So whatever you decide, you know, just as long as you do it with a good heart, you know. So I started teaching both male and females. I just, when I teach the females, I um, make sure that they understand it's a lot of work. You know, it's a lot of muscle that you have to pull up on your, your head -o, and you have to um, use that strength, you know, and it, it's, it's tiresome at times, especially if you're, you're in a, in a uh, nonstop 
mood where you don't want to stop, you know. And I, I had a couple of females that had to drop out of it, you know. But most of the uh, younger ones, they they continue on with it. So I also teach them some of the the aspects and rituals of of belt weaving. You know, I just kind of tell them, use your your common sense. You know, you use your knowledge. You know. We only have about one minute left here, but I want to talk about the Poe Cultural Center. Tell our viewers where they can find it and what exactly they can find there. Okay. The Poe Culture Center is located here in Milwaukee, and it was established in 1988 to continue the arts in belt weaving, pottery, moccasin making, jewelry, you know. So we teach Native students uh, these crafts during our three semesters. We also have a museum and we also have um, history here that people can ask about, you know. So if you're ever in Northern New Mexico, come check us out, you know, come check us out and take a tour of our building, you know. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. The Sand Creek Massacre, the betrayal that changed Cheyenne and Arapaho people forever, focuses on tribal accounts of Colorado's deadliest day. Exhibition details at HistoryColoradoCenter.org. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.